become your dream. And we reveal our picks for the number one movie of the decade. Plus, the movies you can't miss this weekend, including It's Complicated with Meryl Streep, Alec Baldwin, and Steve Martin. I've never really known how to live without you. Holmes, what are you doing? Nothing. Are you wearing a false nose now? No. Tell me that that was a false nose. Holmes, where are you going? Robert Downey Jr. made a big splash last year with Iron Man. Can he do it again with Sherlock Holmes? I'm A.O. Scott of the New York Times. That is the question, and I'm Michael Phillips of the Chicago Tribune. Surely you remember Sherlock Holmes, the cerebral sleuth in the deerstalker hat who used his incomparable powers of deduction to solve complicated crimes in Victorian England. Yeah, well, forget about him. In Guy Ritchie's version, Holmes, played by Robert Downey Jr., is a rock and roll kickboxing badass with ripped abs and a sarcastic wit, who has, of all things, a girlfriend, or at least a love interest, a fetching thief played by Rachel McAdams. I need your help. I need you to find someone. Why are you always so suspicious? Shall I answer chronologically or alphabetically? Careful not to cut yourself on this lethal envelope. This Irene, as she's known, is a splash of color in Richie's studiously grimy London and a third wheel in the bromance between Holmes and Dr. Watson, played with good-natured straight man restrained by Jude Law. You never complained about my methods before. I never complain. When do I complain about you practicing the violin at three in the morning? Or your mess? Your general lack of hygiene or the fact that you steal my clothes? Is this movie overblown, preposterous, and chaotic? Why, yes. It's a Guy Ritchie movie, which means it emphasizes style over sense and macho bluff over refinement and wit. With its shock devotees of Arthur Conan Doyle's stories? Without a doubt, Conan Doyle never envisioned anything like this. In summary, ears ringing, jaw fractured, three ribs cracked, four broken, diaphragm hemorrhaging, physical recovery, six weeks, full psychological recovery, six months. The plot involves a murderous minister returned from the dead and a satanic cabal trying to take over the world and a twist that sets up a sequel. But as a piece of slick, empty entertainment, it's not completely terrible. Mostly thanks to Downey, who's reliably stylish and smarter than the movie he's in. And he's probably why you should rent it. Wait a minute, not terrible, you didn't hate it. That's <laughs> enough to say rent it? No, 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 I hated this film. You I said skip it. it, really, truly. I mean, I've never liked any of other Guy Ritchie's previous stuff, the modern day crime thrillers, but, uh, you know, fine, he can make the movies he wants to make, but when he starts messing with these beloved archetypes. Were you a, were you a Sherlock Holmes fan not as, a medium, as a kid? Medium, but, uh. but not, not a, I, I don't care about fidelity to the original Conan Doyle mm -hmm. stories. I just care that this is not a mystery worth solving, that the whole style of this thing is this sort of grinding, sadistic, you know, to totally depressing kind of atmosphere, you got, you, you no got, good. You got no pleasure out of watching Jude Law and, 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 and Robert Downey I Jr. Like the kind actors. of no, riffing and, off each other. And this is why I, I, was, I, I was, was kind of fun. truly hoping that this was the first Guy Ritchie film that I would respond to or at least overlook what I don't like about his kinetic style of nonsense and, <laughs> and sort of at least enjoy the actors. But it, even people as good as Downey just can't do anything about the this technique that is all, you know, just in your face every second, and I do not personally get any pleasure from seeing Holmes or Watson headbutting their way through a bunch of thugs in London. No fun for me. <laughs> no fun. <laughs> well, a little bit of fun for me. All right, all right. Next movie, I wonder, was the director of The Young Victoria wearing a corset right alongside Emily Blunt? This is one tightly constricted period drama. Now, on the other hand, Emily Blunt, I love. She was the snarky assistant in The Devil Wears Prada, and she just got a Golden Globe nomination for this role. Here she plays the 19th century teenage princess who became Queen Victoria. And in this scene, she matches wits with her future husband, Prince Albert, played by Rupert Friend. Do you ever feel like a chess piece yourself? In a game being played against your will? Do you? Constantly. Then you had better master the rules of the game until you play it better than they can. You don't recommend I find a husband to play it for me? I should find one to play it with you, not for you. The political machinations of the young Victoria are laid out very simply by screenwriter Julian Fellows, though you wonder why the author of Gosford Park needed to be quite so solemn about it all. Here is a rare exception. I will not have my role usurped. I wear the crown, and if there are mistakes, they will be my mistakes, and no one else will make them. No one, not even you. 
The director, Jean-Marc Vallée, tries to show us that Victoria wasn't always the We Are Not Amused monarch we know from history books, but this film badly needs a respirator. It proceeds at a dutiful and finally inert pace, and as good as Blunt is, I'm not sure she's really right for this part. After a while, you'd pay to see her go nuts and turn the whole thing into a spoof. So I say, skip it. Dull, dull. Tony, no, I'm sorry. Tony, I, I, I dozed off during one of those clips. Um, yes, uh, skip it. I mean, there, yes. there's something, there's a very interesting story that's trying to be told here about, you know, a young woman who is, who is, who's been raised in a very sort of sheltered way and who has to figure out how to negotiate love and political power and all of these things. But the way this story is told is just basically by people reading letters in voiceover while you look at beautiful furniture. Right. And it is deadly. <laughs> yeah, I know. It doesn't, that's a good point. I think, I mean, a movie like Bright Star, which I didn't like nearly as much as you did, that's a film that's kind of letter dependent. Well, better really letters. Does, yeah, better letters. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, you know, we're fascinated by the, the, the lives of royalty Absolutely, just before yeah. they become right. who we know them as. And, and this film, I think Blunt is a good actress, but also the one thing that held me back a little bit from this, from really engaging fully with yeah. What she's doing is that Blunt is is an actress who always seems to be slightly amused about something going on. So really, right. she's not quite right. right for Victoria. Well, no, because especially even at, at at this point where she's both amused and lively, but she's also supposed to be kind of uncertain and a, a lost young woman. And and Emily Blunt is actually in a way too self confident and too regal to play that right. kind of. Right, right. It's not a question of being in period. It's really more of that spirit, I think. But but the writing well, is missing. Well, Latin. and 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 the, and the filmmaking is just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Adult. Coming up next, multiple Oscar winners singing and dancing in the musical Nine. And later, Heath Ledger makes his final on-screen appearance in the Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus. The extraordinary Dr. Parnassus. Guido! 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 You're perfect. i better not kiss you. No, don't kiss me. I might bite you. We're in shades in the middle of the... Not since the towering inferno has such a distinguished cast been assembled for such a disaster. Directed by Rob Marshall, who won a Best Picture Oscar for Chicago, Nine stars Academy Award winners Daniel Day-Lewis, Marion Cotillard, Nicole Kidman, Judi Dench, and Penelope Cruz, as well as Oscar nominee Kate Hudson. It's based on a hit Broadway show that was inspired by one of the great movies of all time, Federico Fellini's Eight and a Half. What could go wrong? Take a look. Mamma mia! That's Fergie belting out a number called Be Italian, one of a bunch of gratingly literal-minded songs choreographed with strip club vulgarity and edited into a busy, gaudy mess. Day-Lewis plays Guido, a famous director who's struggling to find inspiration for his next movie. Everyone calls him Maestro, but his main talents seem to be smoking, looking good in skinny suits, and making an unholy mess of his love life. Penelope Cruz, battling a quarter-day mascara habit, plays his mistress. Guido, everybody knows about me. Why? Why won't you let me near you? For the very same reason you don't want me to die on top of you. It's not fair to your husband. It's not fair to my wife. Please let me come with you. No. I'll be here waiting for you. The only performer who retains any dignity at all is Marion Cotillard as Guido's long-suffering wife. My husband makes movies to make them he lives a kind of dream at one point kate hudson sings a hymn to the glories of italian cinema but this movie is to fellini what alvin and the chipmunks are to rock and roll how do you say skip it in italian oh, wait a minute tony i say rent it in italian on this one i mean i felt about this the way you felt about sherlock holmes i mean, I mean you, that you're, you're, kind of fun in your words. incorrect opinion on sherlock holmes that it was you know empty and really kind of a style show but but fun that's how i felt about nine I, I, rob marshall who directed chicago yeah. really isn't directing this material any better or worse than did with Chicago. He's like a journeyman director, but this material, granted, is so much thinner than Chicago, and there's hardly thinner a story. Very, there's hardly a story. Is a polite
right way to say it. It's it's catastrophic. This movie is an abomination. Wow, Michael. no, 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 it is so no. bad it's to watch these bad. actresses, to watch Penelope Cruz do this kind of bump and grind stuff. The songs, which are bad enough to begin with, are edited in such a way that you have sort of someone sitting at a table thinking, and then it cross cuts to the same person, right, right, you know, right. in a bustier doing. Well, this, it's, this, it's, this it's the same strategy dance. as you had with Chicago, where every number in Chicago was through the mind of the Renee Zellweger character, right? And here it's the same thing with the Daniel Day Lewis character. But there's nothing interesting in his mind. Oh, I agree. Here, now you mentioned the cinema italiano number that Kate Hudson sings. Yeah. That is, for me, because Rob Marshall's sensibility as a director is always near the fashion runway. So mm -hmm. <laughs> that number is on a fashion runway. And it's the one song I enjoyed, you know? Well, and she's a good dancer. So. Well, I was more satisfied with the latest issue of, of Maxim. <laughs> Coming up next, we've counted down the top 10 movies of the decade. Now it's time for Michael and me to reveal our picks for the best movie of the decade. And later, it's Christmas weekend, and there are a lot of good movies in theaters, including Meryl Streep and It's Complicated. We'll tell you which ones you shouldn't miss. After 10 years and 5,000 movies, it's time to give our picks for the number one movie of the decade. My choices so far have been Million Dollar Baby, 25th Hour, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, Four Months, Three Weeks, and Two Days, The Best of Youth, Where the Wild Things Are, The Pianist, Brokeback Mountain, and AI. Like AI, my pick for the best movie of the decade is the story of a lonely machine who ends up in a world without people. It's WALL-E, the story of a steadfast little robot who falls in love and saves the human race from extinction. The first part of this movie, a virtually wordless tour of the depopulated, trash-strewn planet Earth, is funny, poignant, and downright visionary. And when a sleek new model named Eve shows up, what a lovely love story. This is the finest animation put out under the Pixar label this decade, which is saying an awful lot. And this studio, since 2006, part of the Disney company, has used the newest technology to fulfill the oldest promise of this medium, making movies for everyone. Wally may have a chilling, cautionary undertone about our species' self-destructive tendencies, but its warmth, its generosity, and its humor ensure that people will be watching this movie for as long as we care about film. I, I agree. It's a gorgeous film. That first half hour, as you mentioned, is, is as good as I've seen in 10 years yeah. in any medium. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I had a, a little trouble at the end with the action climax is sort of mm -hmm. piling up, mm -hmm. as I did with some other Pixar pictures. Yeah. But, but really, these are small problems in huge achievements. Just great. My Decade's Best List, Minority Report, Gosford Park, Mulholland Drive, United 93, Zodiac, E2 Mama Tambien, Once, Climates, and Ratatouille. And my pick for the best movie of the decade, There Will Be Blood. This most eccentric and haunting of modern epics is driven by oil man Daniel Plainview, who, in the hands of actor Daniel Day-Lewis, becomes a Horatio Alger story gone horribly wrong. Writer-director Paul Thomas Anderson's camera is as crucial to the film's hypnotic pull as the performance at its center. No matter what the others promise to do, when it comes to the showdown, they won't be there. For its evocation of the early 1900s, its relentless focus on one man's fascinating obsessions, and for its inspiring example of how to freely adapt a novel, plus what I think is the performance of the new century, There Will Be Blood Stands Alone. Abandon my child. Say it louder. Say it louder. I've abandoned my child! The more I see it, the sadder and stranger and more visually astounding it grows, and the more it seems to say about the best and the worst in the American ethos of rugged individualism. Awfully Michael. good. I'm drinking your milkshake. So you agree? You I, agree. I, I agree. I agree. mean, for me, the ending still doesn't that last quite half hour. work there. The yeah. last half odd, hour yes. is, is <laughs> odd and inscrutable, but you're absolutely right. I mean, th th this character is just one of the great movie characters who has an almost Shakespearean dimension. It's about, it's about both the heroism and the monstrosity of, of American I capitalism. The second time I saw the film, I did find that ending, which leaps into tragic comedy, sort of unexpectedly, much easier to take, and now I can kind of I, I kind of love it. So. Well, that's, that, that one's going to be around for a long time. And both Wally and there will be blood are available now on DVD. Tony and I have given our lists. Now it's your turn. Here are the top 10 movies of the decade as chosen by more than 30,000 of our viewers. At number 10, Mulholland Drive. Number 9, Children of Men. 
Number eight, very good choice, Pan's Labyrinth. Number seven, a Best Picture winner, No Country for Old Men. At six, another Best Picture Oscar winner, The Departed. Number five, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. And number four, Michael's favorite, There Will Be Blood. Number three, my favorite, Wally. -E. Number two, The Dark Knight. And our viewers' pick for the number one movie of the decade is Lord of the Rings, Return of the King. The unbeatable Lord of the Rings. Well, 30,000 people, it's pretty good taste, very good taste, actually. Yeah. Very happy to see a lot of props for Children of Men, the Alfonso yeah. Cuarón. Yeah. That's, that's a very good film. Yeah. All right. Tony and I will talk about the movies that almost made our lists on our website. Just click on Web Exclusives. And coming up next, Heath Ledger, Johnny Depp, and Colin Farrell star in the Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus. Well, up. When 28-year-old Heath Ledger died nearly two years ago, he was midway through making The Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus, about an immortal traveling carny, played by Christopher Plummer. Plummer plays Dr. Parnassus, who makes a deal with the devil, played by Tom Waits, immortality in exchange for his daughter's soul when she turns 16. Ledger plays a mysterious man who joins the traveling players. Once you enter the Imaginarium, you're actually inside the doctor's mind. In the real world, the traveling act could use a few more customers. Tony, played by Ledger, has an idea or two on how to get them. You know, it's quite obvious that people, you know, not many people are attracted to the show. Oh, thank you so much. Well, you know, forgive me, but I, I, I have a couple of solutions to your problems. One, I was thinking of, you know, changing the style of the show. And two, I would um, change the audience, perhaps. Ledger died before he shot any scenes taking place inside the Imaginarium. So, Gilliam revised the script to allow Tony to turn into different people, played by Johnny Depp, Jude Law, and Colin Farrell. And, uh, well, didn't I say you'd be happy here? Gives me just perfect. Perfect. The result? Well, Gilliam's visually assaultive technique doesn't make it easy on either the story or the actors. Gilliam's story of unappreciated artists has its moments, but true joy is scarce here. And I hate to say it, but you can skip it. And Tony, I think it's, it's I say skip it, even though it's such a strong reminder of how good an actor Ledger really was. Well, and, and, and for that reason and some others, I, I disagree with you. I say, I say see it. Really? I mean, I, I don't think it's up there with, with Brazil or The Fisher King or, or Terry, Terry Gilliam's really great movies. Uh -huh. But there's a lot of not just visual inventiveness here, but some interesting things that he does with the story and the, and the characters. I mean, I thought that there was some wonderful scenes with Heath Ledger and, and Christopher Plummer. I thought just the whole atmosphere here of the movie was just really interesting and intriguing and I just I went with it and I thought that that the stuff that happens inside the professor's mind where you have these different characters each kind of projecting their own fantasies into this world were really fascinating and beguiling and enchanting in a way that let's say Peter Jackson's vision of heaven in the lovely bones right. failed to be. I know what you mean but uh, to me Gilliam you know he's the last filmmaker alive who still believes in the fisheye lens and, and in that sort of like hyper distorted you know I hate to say it but sort of a 60s style of filmmaking and to me it just smothers the picture the one scene as you mentioned though between Plummer and Ledger that's where you really notice that my god here you have an 80 year old you know yeah. master actor like Plummer you know kind of meeting in the middle with this wonderful young talent who's no longer with well, us. Well I think there are actually many such moments and, and, and enough um, and okay. also enough enough dazzle to, we to, to make this a, we a surprisingly interesting picture. <laughs> Coming up next movies you shouldn't miss over the holiday weekend including Meryl Streep, Alec Baldwin and Steve Martin in It's Complicated. Why so tense big fella. Closed captioning for At The Movies is sponsored by crafted to be exceptionally smooth decadently rich delightful chocolate bliss hershey's bliss chocolate crafted for bliss hotel provided by park hyatt chicago chicago's award-winning hotel and luxury dining experience located in the heart of chicago's magnificent mile on water tower square You're looking very beautiful tonight. Oh. Oh, I love when you smell like butter. What are you doing here? I missed you. Mm -hmm. It's 9 o'clock. Where does your wife think you are? 
yoga. That was a scene from It's Complicated, starring Meryl Streep, Alec Baldwin, and Steve Martin. We had an early review on last week's show, and we liked it pretty well. It's one of the movies worth catching this weekend. Michael, what are some others? You know, Up in the Air, certainly the George Clooney film, directed yeah, by Jason yeah. Reitman. Crazy Heart, as we talked about. Jeff Bridges, one of his best performances sure, from a great actor. Yeah. Yes. How about you? Um, I would say uh, Invictus, the, the, the Clint Eastwood movie, mm -hmm. starring Morgan Freeman and, and Matt Damon. Um, a great, you know, inspiring, rousing story. Also, Avatar, which made me feel like I was I was a kid again being blown <laughs> away by this magic stuff right. that was happening on screen. Especially for the first hour or so, yeah. Yeah, good. absolutely. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Just go to atthemoviestv.com to find out how. That's it for now. We'll leave you with a recap of this week's show. Join us next week when we'll be counting down our picks for the best movies of 2009. Until then, we'll be at the movies. America's broadband users can save $16 billion a year and $300 individually by switching to Net Zero Dial Up at $9.95 per month. Call 1 800 Net Zero or go to netzero.com. Treat yourself to holiday hotcakes at IHOP with gingerbread, eggnog, and pecan pie pancakes. IHOP. Come hungry, leave happy, and treat someone special with a gift card. Activon Ultra Strength for powerful pain relief. A convenient applicator means no messy creams. Activon, applied directly where it hurts for joint pain, muscle pain, arthritis, and backache. In my kitchen, I want only the best in taste. Eggland's best. I love Eggland's best because of all the great nutrition. That's why they're the only eggs I give to my son, the chef. Eggland's best, the better egg.